Hello and thank you for joining me and welcome to chapter two of Kitty Kelly's The Royals. Now I have had such a fantastic reaction to the first couple of episodes. It's been really exciting. And so what I'm going to do is something a little bit different. We're going to go through the chapter and there's lots of juices in this chapter. And then at the end, before I go, I'm going to read out five comments that I've selected for, that were under the last video. So we can start a bit of discussion going because a lot of your comments are so interesting and they deserve to have attention drawn to them. So that's what I'm going to do from now on. So if you leave your comment, it may be selected <laughs> to be featured in the next one. So that's how we'll do it. So chapter two, we're going back in time. We're going back to the time of the First World War and King George V. And I've got to say, some people are a little bit snobbish about Kitty Kelly and things like that. But I've got to say that I've read a lot of books about this era and the thing is that with Kitty Kelly, I find that I can remember what she said. She has a way of humanising things like the First World War and the feeling in Great Britain at the time. And it sort of resonates and stays with me. It's more accessible. Um, so I think she's actually quite a powerful writer. And I'll let, oh, I'll be interested to see what you think anyway. Enough babbling on. Here we go, chapter two. Now I'm going to read out her first few lines because it sets the scene so powerfully. Once upon a time, the House of Windsor was a fantasy, the figment of a courtier's imagination. The dynasty was created in 1917 to conceal the German roots of the king and the queen, and the deception enabled the monarchy to be perceived as British by subjects who despise Germany. And that was the case. I mean, Paul, really, when you look at this and when you read this chapter, you realise that really the royal family and the institution of the monarchy has gone through some really tough times. Like we think that they're getting attacked by all sides now and that they're going through incredibly tough times. But compared to what King George V had to put up with, you know, it doesn't seem quite so bad. He was in a really precarious situation. So I'll tell you about it because it was, it was really precarious. By 1915, England finally had a king, King George V, who could speak English without a German accent. Now that just blew my mind because I had no way of sort of knowing or realising that any monarchs before King George V spoke English with a German accent. I had no idea. I mean, intellectually, I probably had an idea, but he was the first king that spoke the king's English without a German accent. I found that fascinating. So the English, as far as the early 1900s, had felt increasingly threatened by the Kaiser's oppression. And George Bernard Shaw actually described it as they were sore headed and fed up. They were sick of the sabre rattling. And there was all these editorials in the, you know, in the tabloid newspapers back in 1915, and they were denounced as the March of the Hun and treason to civilization. And there was much reports of German U-boats actually sinking British ships. So you can imagine very high anti-German feeling. But something a little sad was that English citizens that just happened to be German, that had lived in Great Britain, you know, pretty much all their lives, uh, were being targeted, in particular German butchers. Um, you know, their shops were being stoned, their windows smashed. Uh, people that owned Dachshunds were actually targeted. Uh, pretzels were banned. And the symphony conductors shunned Mozart and Beethoven. So, you know, there, it was really ch highly charged, highly emotionally charged. And this infected also America, where Hollywood produced a string of hate films such as To Hell with the Kaiser and The Beast of Berlin. Now, you would have heard about The Beast of Berlin. Actually, I think you can even uh, Google the Beast of Berlin and I think you can get clips of it up on YouTube. The king became so concerned about the reaction of his volatile subjects that he was even afraid to protect relatives of his that were of German descent. And this is really interesting. His beloved cousin, Prince Louis of Battenberg, who guess who he is? He is actually Lord Louis Mountbatten's 
father. Lord Louis Mountbatten was his younger son. And we all know that Lord Louis Mountbatten was Prince Philip's uncle and also sort of served as a, as a replacement grandfather for Prince Charles because, of course, Prince Charles, King George VI died when uh, Prince Charles was very young. So uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten was sort of looked on by Prince Charles as a sort of grandfather figure. So Lord Louis Mountbatten's father was Prince Louis of Battenberg and he was vilified simply because of his German name. Now, he was the first sea lord of the Royal Navy and he mobilised the Admiralty with great speed and efficiency as soon as war broke out. He was a stellar person. He was respected and admired, you know, by all, all throughout the Navy. Despite his total loyalty to the, to the crown, he was forced to resign his military position and relinquish his princely title. The final humiliation occurred when the king told him to change his name, shattered Prince Louis dutifully, anglicised Battenberg and turned it into Mount Batten. So that's when they became uh, Mount Batten to make it acceptable to the English. So you can imagine that would be really traumatic and it would seem so unjust and so unfair. And that would probably explain the sort of chip on the shoulder that Lord Louis Mountbatten carried throughout his life. The king tried to mollify his cousin by making him a British noble. So he tried to pacify him with that and he made him the Marquis of Milford Haven because he wanted his children to be noblemen. Well, Prince Louis uh, accepted it, but he never recovered from the shame of renouncing his ancestry, which I imagine you wouldn't. But he did have a sense of humour about it. He actually visited one of his older sons and in, in the house guest book for the weekend shooting party or whatever it is, he wrote, June 9th arrived Prince Hyde, June 19th departed Lord Jekyll. So he had a sense of humour about it. That says a little bit about Lord Louis Mountbatten. As I said, he was his younger son. His younger son, a namesake, Louis, was shocked by the news of his father's resigna resignation. It was all so stupid, he recalled years later. My father had been in the Royal Navy for 46 years. He was completely identified with England and we always regarded ourselves as an English family. Well, 46 years. 46 years, you know, it's pretty shabby treatment, isn't it? Next, the king moved to cleanse the rest of his German family. And so with one stroke of a royal quill, he turned all his sort of royal relatives that were in Great Britain into um, uh, all the dukes, archdukes and princelings were turned into English noblemen at the stroke of a quill. He decreed that members of the royal family could then marry into nobility. So now that's a huge change. So for the first time in history, royalty could marry commoners, which of course paved the way for uh, Bertie to marry Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who you know ended up being the Queen Mother. So that was a huge change, whether they were titled or not. Actually, it goes on to say that that he, this paved the way for his second son, Albert, known to the family as Bertie, to propose to a sweet-faced Scottish girl reared as an earl's daughter. Now, here's a little bit of controversy. Now, Lady C has written a book about the Queen Mother, and she refers to this. Many other, even authorised royal biographers, hint at it. But this is what Kitty Kelly says about the origins of the Queen Mum. Although her mother has been rumoured to have been one of the Earl Welsh's servants' girls' babies, right? But this has never been borne out by any evidence. Now, that's not what Lady C. Lady C says that uh, it, was the, it was the chef, the French chef or the French cook that he had an affair with. And evidently his wife didn't mind much because she was over being intimate with the Queen Mum's dad. So she was quite happy to go along with it and, and accept Elizabeth as her legitimate daughter. But, you know, it's like I said, it's never been proved. But Elizabeth Bowes Lyon brought stability to the British throne and propped up the dynasty for several generations. Now, I made a note here 
that, again, like between her father and the French cook. But I made a note that Lady Colin Campbell's book claimed that the Queen Mother was a result of a surrogacy arrangement. So there you go. You'll have to read her book as well. So, and there was, a, and in the end of her life, the Queen Mother even made little giggly jokes about that. So, you know, she hinted, she hinted at it, but it was never officially acknowledged or admitted. During the First World War, concern was voiced over the bloody role of the King's German cousin, who was in charge of British prisoners of war in a camp outside Berlin. Now, the king sort of qualified this. King George V qualified this. He's not really fighting on the side of the Germans, said the king defensively. He was only put in charge of a camp of English prisoners. Now, the Prime Minister Asquith said wasn't really convinced by this distinction. So like I said, there was a lot of anti-German feeling and a lot of it was sort of blowing the king's way. It was hotting up, it was hotting up. And his successor, Lord George, was even more blunt when he received a royal summons to the palace. He actually said, and this is a direct quote, I wonder what my little German friend has got to say to me about King George V. And evidently, King George V's private secretary uh, was treated in a rather shabby way when he used to go to the House of Lords to deliver messages. So, you know, it's all hotting up. Now, also, it's interesting about D.H. Lawrence. I didn't even understand or know this. He was hounded into hiding because he married a German woman at the time. And she was the sister of the legendary Red Baron. I didn't know anything about that, about D.H. Lawrence. That's fascinating. Now, the Red Baron was said to have shot down 80 Allied planes during World War I. And after their wedding, Lawrence and his bride Frieda were forced by public hostility. Oh, maybe I didn't know about it, but it's just sort of brought it to the forefront of my mind, to seek refuge in the English countryside where they hid in barns like animals. Wow. I mean, this was frightening, wasn't it? The news was unsettling to the king, who also had a German wife. But the clever queen, Mary of Teck, although she spoke English with a guttural accent, she declared herself English from top to toe. So she just wasn't having any of it. But the hatred of Germans became so intense in England that the king's mother actually begged him to remove the Kaiser's honorary flags from St George's Chapel. And the Daily Mail actually had a go at him. You know, the Daily Mail hasn't changed much, has it? <laughs> it's always having a go at the royal family. And they said, as long as the offending banners remain, their owners will be prayed for, thundered the newspaper. What are the king's advisers doing? Now, isn't that funny? Because that, of course, reminds us what's happening now with Catherine. What is the, you know, palace's advisers doing? What are their communications team doing? You know, it's the same refrain. Things don't change. They just repeat, don't they? Rinse and repeat. The king then threw himself and his family into the war effort. Now, this was a clever, good PR move. He dispatched his sons to the Western Front, sending the Prince of Wales, who was Edward, who later became the Duke of Windsor, and, of course, you know, with um, Wallace Simpson, the abdicating king. He was sent to the uh, France, while Prince Albert Bertie, who became the king, served on the battleship HMS Collingwood, the king banned all alcohol. Oh, that would have been tough. <laughs> it's hard enough to deal with war without having a having a dookie da to cope and began strict rationing at the palace to set a national example. Well, I guess that's very good and very forthright. He wanted to be exemplary. He wanted no whiff of scandal in his reign. The king felt he needed to separate himself from Russian imperialism, especially when wrapped with a German ribbon. So he wrote his cousin that he did not think it was advisable that the imperial family should take up residence in this country. So this was, of course, the Tsar, um, who were in peril and wanted their cousin, you know, King George V, to save them and allow them asylum. 
So he suggested instead, instead Spain or the south of France. Now, this is terrible. At that point, the revolutionaries in Russia realised that the king would not use military force to save his relatives, thus abandoned. The Tsar and his family were seized and sent to Siberia. Now, we all know what happened then. Yes, but, I, you know, King George V really felt that if he allowed the Tsar and his family into Great Britain, that it could be the end of the monarchy in Great Britain. Um, they, he was, they were all really just balancing on a knife point at that time. Lord Stamfordham founded and secured his place in history by proposing the name of Windsor. So, sorry, I forgot to read a sentence prior to that. So they were looking for a way to anglify themselves and um, Lord Stamfordham found the idea of proposing the name of Windsor. The proclamation of the House of Windsor was announced in July 17th, 1970, and it made the front pages of every English newspaper. It made really the front pages of newspapers all over the world, and it was praised all over the world. It was a popular move. In Germany, the news was reported with less reverence. The Kaiser laughed at his cousin and said that he was looking forward to attending a performance of that well-known play, The Merry Wives of Saxe Coburg Gotha. But the Kaiser appreciated the political necessity of the accommodation. So he sort of got his own way, his own back, though, because later when the king died, uh, the Duke of Saxe Coburg Gotha uh, went to his cousin's funeral in Windsor Castle and he wore his Nazi uniform. But by keeping his distance, the King of England had held his crown in place. Now, if you have this book, you will know that I am only reading out very brief snippets in this chapter. And so to get the full picture and the and they get a real deep understanding, you know, you'll know if you have the book that it's just a fascinating chapter. But I'm just trying to give everyone a taste and an overview and deliver the most impactful moments in this chapter. So it says in this that, like I said, King George V was, you know, really trying to be exemplary and trying to be perfect. And like his grandmother, Queen Victoria, he excelled at the virtues the English prize most. And guess what they are? Duty and punctuality. <laughs> he adored his wife indulged his daughter and terrorised his five sons. I was frightened of my father and I am damn well going to see to it that my children are frightened of me. <laughs> no idea why. Now, he's a bit of a dull sort of nerdy guy. For recreation, he licked postage stamps and placed them with childlike precision in his blue leather stamp books. Imagine what they'd be worth now. Um, now, of course, there were tragedies in the family and really sad things. Uh, they were very unenlightened about mental illness then. And the Prince of Wales, so that's known as David, which was Edward, Prince of Wales, who then became Duke of Windsor, just to get everything in context and in the timeline, um, he never considered the condition of his youngest brother, Prince John. It was actually a source of shame for the family. And he was the last of the monarch's six children, and John was mentally retarded and an epileptic. He probably became uh, mentally retarded, as they used to say in those days, but I guess he sustained brain damage because of the untreated epilepsy, because really violent convulsions can affect, you know, and, and scar the brain. He was secretly removed from the family at an early age and lived on a farm in the Sandringham estate. So, I mean, I assume... He would have had quite a pleasant life, I hope so anyway, where he died in 1919 at the age of 13. Oh. As uneducated as the king was, he won respect of his subjects because of his conscientious performance and, and he loved military uniforms. He loved the pomp and circumstance and he would thrill the crowds by, you know, he organised a lot of parades and he always turned up in a new military uniform and so they loved it. They fell for it. I mean, let's face it, they didn't have Netflix. 
but they could go off to it on a Sunday and see a stirring parade and then enjoy a picnic afterwards. And so it was entertainment really, wasn't it? By the time King George V died in 1936, his beleaguered country was on the brink of another world war with Germany, which would end Britain's imperial power and, and cause the birth of the Commonwealth as we know it now, the modern version of the Commonwealth, because that voluntary organisation was the result of the end of imperialism after the Second World War. And the House of Windsor, which he built on the quicksand of illusion, started sinking under the weight of scandal. Wow, nothing changes, does it? And of course, the weight of scandal was the Prince of Wales, who was besotted with a married American divorcee named Wallace Walford, Warfield, Warfield, sorry, Simpson. Now, he forbade his son to marry a woman who was defiled by divorce, and he, she wasn't even allowed to be actually brought into their uh, royal presence. When the king was dying, he made his wife swear that he would, she would never receive the despised Mrs. Simpson, and she stuck to it. And it makes the point in this chapter that his wife saw him as sort of more than human. She saw him as her almighty lord and sovereign and obeyed his command for the rest of his days. And his view of his younger son, Bertie, was although Bertie's stutter and stammer irritated him beyond bearing, he would have done anything to save the crown from the Prince of Wales and his wenching ways. Now, it makes the point in a paragraph on this last page of this chapter that he really wanted the throne to go to Bertie and then by extension to Our Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. He adored his granddaughter, absolutely adored her and thought that she would be a marvellous queen. She called him Grandpapa England because he referred to the national anthem God Save the King as his song. She sat on his lap, tousled his hair, pulled his beard and plucked food from his plate for her Welsh corgi dogs. So she loved her Welsh corgis even when she was a little girl. She also made him get down on his hands and knees to play horsey with her. Now this is very moving, this bit, I thought, and I could just imagine it. The old king doted on his first granddaughter and held her in his arms on the balcony of Buckingham Palace so she could hear the crowd roar. They're cheering for you, you know, he told her. And he confided his wish about the succession to an equerry. And this is an actually a direct quote from King George V. I pray to God that my elder son Edward will never marry and have children and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. Now, he got critically ill and he died on January 20th, 1936. But I didn't know this. His end was hastened with a combination of cocaine and morphine. And do you know why? So that his death could be announced in the morning times rather than the less prestigious afternoon newspapers. So he lost his life to meet a newspaper deadline, she says, Kitty Kelly says. And she finishes this chapter with such was the legacy of the House of Windsor, which would eventually rise and fall as a puppet show for the media. So like I said, she gets the digs in <laughs> whenever she can. She is obviously, Kitty Kelly is obviously not a monarchist, not a fan of the whole system and the royal family. She makes that blatantly obvious. But like I said, what she does share about that time and the vivid way she writes about it. And I actually find it really interesting because me believing in the monarchy and believing in the royal family isn't based on the personalities and the transgressions or lack thereof of any single member of the royal family. I can accept their flaws and still believe in the system and the value of it. Um, I accept they're human. You know, I don't expect, I don't put them on a pedestal and, and although I'm pretty close to putting Catherine on a pedestal <laughs> because I just think she's incredibly brave and I like her and I think she's, she's a figure we can admire and I like the fact that she just gets on with things and is, you know, 
displays duty. But I know the king is flawed. I know Camilla's flawed, Queen Camilla's flawed. I know, you know, Prince William, you know, isn't said to have a temper. I mean, they're all human. They're all human beings. So I don't rely on them to be perfect in order to uh, believe in the system. Are you like that? You know, you don't need, I can hear, you know, contrary things about them and it doesn't upset me. I, I just think it's juicy and interesting. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get on to your comments and I've handpicked. Now, there have been so many fantastic comments. It's really hard to pick, you know, comments. So don't take offence if yours isn't chosen. But this was after the last chapter and these were the comments that were left behind. I'm just going to share five for a bit of book club discussion. This is from Deborah Nielsen, 2002. It couldn't have been easy for Margaret to be the spare and understand her marital difficulties, but at some point, shouldn't everyone grow up? And that was liked by many, many people who approved of that comment. Yes, I can see that. And it's it was fascinating to see your reactions to the Princess Margaret chapter. Now, this one's for Space Cadet. Triple zero seven. So a bit of James Bond as well. Zero zero seven, but it's triple zero seven. Poor Queen Elizabeth. She must have had the patience of a saint <laughs> with all the errant family members she was surrounded by. True, she did go through it, didn't she, over her 70-year reign? Uh, next comment. I always thought, this is from Bridget McLaurin, 198. I always thought that if George VI hadn't died when Margaret was so young, she would have married someone more suitable. She went off the rails after he died. Yes, maybe that's why she went for Townsend. But but then again, she was sweet on Townsend before her father died. So I see what you're saying. You're saying that um, she was sort of going for a father figure with that love affair, but then she sort of probably panicked a bit and went for Tony Armstrong Jones. Although the rest of the royal family just adored Lord Snowden as he became, or Earl of Snowden. Was it Lord Snowden, Earl of Snowden? Is it Earl's Lords? I, I have no idea. See, this is a disadvantage. I don't have all that knowledge at the tip of my fingers. But the whole royal family loved Tony Armstrong Jones. You maybe make a very good point there. Jane Knight, 3597. Princess Margaret had my sympathy to an extent she was educated at home mostly on her own and not allowed to develop any real talent or actually work at anything. There was no prince for her to marry, so all the training she'd had from Queen Mary was for nothing. That's a point, yes, because really Queen Elizabeth II did marry uh, a, a prince because he, you know, it was all renounced and everything, but he was from royal lineage, Prince Philip. Um. So all the training she had was for nothing. It was too soon for a British royal lady to do anything to a professional standard. Hats off to Queen Marguerite of Denmark. True. She was wise enough for her children to be allowed to do better. Yes, her children have been very successful, haven't they? It was sad she could not develop something for herself. It was sad. Yes, yes. She was a good mum in that way. Her children were very successful. And from what I've read about Sarah Armstrong-Jones, she seems to be a particularly lovely, genuine, talented, artistic, brilliant person that everyone in the royal family just adores. Kitty Kelly should be renamed Catty Kelly. I'm not a fan of Princess Margaret, but quite like Roddy Llewellyn. Had lunch with him many moons ago and he was delightful and a real gentleman. So isn't that lovely? That was from Heather Lucia Warren 9459. So isn't that amazing? She actually had lunch with Roddy Llewellyn. For those of you that don't know, that was actually uh, Princess Margaret's last love. She was the one that used, he was the one that he, she used to go off to Mystique and have all those romantic holidays with. And I believe there was real love there. So, I mean, lucky her, at least she did get to have a final fling uh, before all her, you know, illnesses kicked in from her strokes and stuff like that. 
So there you have it. Thank you so much for your comments and please leave comments under chapter two's video, this video. Let me know what you think about King George V. Do you think he should have been braver and rescue his cousins, Tsar Nicholas and his family? Let me know what you think. And I can't wait to see you again for chapter three of Kitty Kelly, the Royals, every Saturday evening at this time. Thanks a lot for joining me. Bye.